Christian in the first century whose name was Polycarp. History tells us that he was converted by the Apostle John and knew the Apostle John very well. He was a bishop or an elder in a city called Smyrna, which we might know from the scriptures, and is a city in modern-day Turkey, which at that time was part of the Roman Empire. Late in his life, uh, persecution against Christianity ramped up. And this persecution against Christianity came upon Christians because the government of Rome began to notice that Christians would refuse to confess that, Jesus, that Caesar is Lord. They were so adamant about Jesus being Lord and Caesar not being Lord that by not confessing that Caesar is Lord and by not making sacrifices to Caesar, they made themselves enemies of the state and therefore had to be eliminated. Polycarp was a prominent Christian, so they were seeking his life. Somehow, Polycarp got word that they were coming after him, so he went into the upper room of a house, and there he prayed until his captors came to arrest him. And when they got there to arrest him and went upstairs, they found Polycarp. And when they came into his room, instead of running or trying to uh, run out of the window or anything like that, he said, let the will of God be done. He asked those arresting him if he could have time to pray, and they let him pray for an hour. Then they loaded him onto a donkey to take him into the city. On the way into the city of Smyrna, there were some government officials that passed by, and they knew Polycarp, and they were begging him, Polycarp, just confess that Caesar is Lord, give him a sacrifice, and your life will be saved. You can still believe in Jesus, you can still be a Christian, just do this to save your life. And Polycarp refused. When they got into the arena, which was pretty much a smaller scale version of what we might know as the Roman Colosseum, when they got into the arena, they first threatened Polycarp with beasts. They were going to unleash lions and animals like that onto him unless he denounced Christ and swear by the fortunes of Caesar. And Polycarp responded thusly, he refused to confess Caesar and said, 80 and six years have I served Jesus. And he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? The one tormenting Polycarp said, Well, if the threat of the beasts won't do it, we're going to have to burn you alive. And Polycarp responded, You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour, and after a little is extinguished, but are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why do you tarry? Bring forth what you will. Now, church tradition tells us they tried to burn Polycarp and it didn't work, so they had to stab him and kill him. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. Either way, he died for his faith. Now, people outside in the world look at that and say, how unfortunate that this man couldn't compromise and just say a couple, few little words and save his life. The question we should ask ourselves is, was Polycarp unfortunate, or was he blessed? The scriptures are very clear that Polycarp and those like him who have died for their faith in Jesus Christ are not unfortunate. They did not get the short end of the stick. They are not unlucky. In fact, they are blessed by God. And I have to imagine that as Polycarp rode into the city to face his end in this life, he couldn't help but be reminded of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. As we continue our series on wanting to be happy and looking at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, we come to the conclusion of this series with Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. I hope you'll turn there. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, we have what is really the culmination of the Beatitudes. We have really the last two uh, blessings that Jesus gives. And we're going to go ahead and read that again for us. Just verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets... Who were before you. So here we see if we want to be happy, if we want to be blessed, if we want the fullness of life that God offers, we have to be persecuted. 
What is persecution? We'll start there. The word translated to persecute or persecution refers to harassing someone because of their beliefs. The Greek word is a compound word which literally means to drive somebody away or to drive somebody out of town. Persecution is seen throughout the New Testament. Think about Jesus. When you read the Gospels, Jesus is persecuted at almost every turn. The Gospel of John, for example, is 21 chapters long. You only have to read till chapter 5. And it says the Jews from that point began to plot on how they would kill Jesus. I mean, that's not even a third of the way through the book. And they're already thinking about how can we end this man's life? They tried to arrest Jesus. They chased him from town to town. They refused him lodging when he went to certain places. They tried to stone him several times by which he escaped. But of course, we know eventually he yielded to them and was hung on the cross. Think about the apostles. The apostles are persecuted almost every turn in the book of Acts. Jesus promised them in John chapters 13 through 16. They'll chase you out of synagogues. They'll bring you before councils. They'll bring you before tribunals. Your own family will hate you. Many of the apostles, history tells us, died for their faith. Persecution is promised for every Christian. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not might be, not perchance maybe, but will be persecuted persecuted. What is persecution? It's the price we pay for reflecting God's light in a world that loves darkness. When you reflect God's light in a world that loves darkness, there will be pushback, there will be mockery, there will be harassment, there will be reviling. It might not always get physical, but there will be persecution. But notice Jesus isn't just talking about persecution broadly. It's not just any kind of persecution that Jesus says is blessed. Look back in the Bible in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Notice what Jesus says. There in verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say, Blessed are those who are persecuted. He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You see, there might be times where persecution or mockery or harassment is brought upon ourselves unnecessarily. There might be times even where it's deserved. Many people are persecuted because of their own selfishness, because of their own sinfulness. People suffer all the time and are mocked because they are foolish, not because they are righteous. So Jesus isn't giving a blanket endorsement to all mistreatment we might face. Sometimes we're mistreated because of our own bad choices. Notice what Jesus says there in verse 11, Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. He doesn't stop there. He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. What's Jesus saying? It's not always a blessing to be mistreated. But it is always a blessing to be mistreated for the sake of Jesus Christ. There's sometimes we're mistreated, and it's not because we're standing up for righteousness. There's sometimes we're mistreated, and it's because the person who's mistreating us is just a sinner, and they don't like us. But Jesus says we are blessed when we suffer for him, and when we're persecuted for the sake of righteousness. This is something the apostles in the early church understood really well. In fact, they saw suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ as the greatest blessing this sinful world had to offer. Turn with me to the book of Acts, if you would. Acts chapter 4. And what we see, really, especially in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 8, is that persecution and mockery didn't stall the early church. It didn't wipe it out. It didn't make people leave the faith. It did the opposite. It emboldened Christians to be even more zealous. It fanned into flame the passion that they had for Jesus and the church. And we're going to notice how the first Christians viewed persecution. Look at Acts 4, beginning in verse 23. Acts 4, verse 23. Peter and John are just released from being arrested for healing somebody in the name of Jesus. And in verse 23, it says, the Bible there, when they were released, they went to their friends and 
and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. They threatened them, do not talk about Jesus anymore. And when they heard it, verse 24, they lifted their voices together to God. So they're praying. Notice their prayer. They don't pray for the persecution to stop. Notice what they pray for. They lift their voices together to God and they say, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, they're quoting Psalm 2 here, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Psalm 2, 1 through 2. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, so here's the content of their prayer. Now they're being persecuted. Persecuted. What do they pray for? And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to no longer be persecuted. That's not what they pray for. Notice what they pray for. And grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They're arrested. They're threatened. They're persecuted for their faith. Notice the content of their prayer. Lord, help us not to keep our mouths shut. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to be more bold. Help us to keep preaching your word. Verse 30, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. If you were arrested and brought in and threatened and told no longer to speak in the name of Jesus, what would you do? The early Christians gathered together and they prayed for boldness. You think there's a lot of things they could pray for. They could pray for the council to repent. They could pray for a rock to fall and to kill the guy who arrested them. There's a lot of things they could pray for. They prayed to keep speaking with boldness. They saw it as a blessing to suffer for the sake of Christ. Turn just a few pages over in your Bible to Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse number 40. Acts chapter 5. Beginning in verse number 40. And this time the apostles are arrested. And they're brought before the council. And the council reminds them, the same council from Acts 4, the council reminds them, remember, we told you not to preach in the name of Jesus. They threatened them some more. And notice verse 40. When they had called in the apostles, they beat them. And they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So now it's physical. They're bruised, they're bloody, they're battered, they're beat up, they're threatened. And you've got to think, am I going to keep preaching in the name of Jesus? Which direction am I going to go? Verse 41, notice their, re- their response. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They left beaten and bruised and bloodied and threatened to no longer preach Jesus, thanking God that they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of Jesus. And we read in verse 42, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. We're going to do the very opposite of what you asked us to do, because Jesus is Lord. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. Notice, how Paul writes about the sufferings of being an apostle and how he compares them to what is coming and how really there's no comparison to be had. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse number 7. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse number 7. And he's very honest. The Corinthians struggled. The Corinthians viewed Paul and said, if you're really an apostle, if you're really blessed by God, shouldn't your life be easy? Shouldn't God bless you at every turn you make? Shouldn't your life, I mean, just a walk in the park. I mean, if you're really blessed by God, wouldn't this life be just super easy for you? Notice what Paul says, beginning in verse number 7. We have this treasure, speaking of the gospel, we have the gospel in jars of clay. That's how he refers to himself and the other apostles. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Paul, why is your life so hard if you're blessed by God? Because Paul's life is not about Paul. Paul's life is about God. And God's trying to prove something to everybody who sees Paul 
And it is that the power in the gospel is not in Paul, but it's in God. And notice what he keeps saying in verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Paul says God is with us even when we're persecuted. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. He says persecution is God's plan to show the power of God. Verse 12, so death is at work in us, but life in you, those to whom he preaches. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Paul, why do you suffer? Why do you do what you do? Why do you not care that you're persecuted? Because I know when I die, Jesus will rise, raise me from the dead and I get to be in the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, we have to get to a point where being risen from the dead and being in the presence of God is worth enduring whatever this world is going to throw at us. We have to have that belief. And if we don't, we'll run away from persecution. We'll run away from mockery. We won't stand up for our faith. But notice the perception of Paul, beginning in verse 15. For it is all for your sake. He wants others to be saved. It is all for your sake. So that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving, notice this, to the glory of God. Paul says, I want to save as many people as possible, not so they talk about how awesome Paul is, but so that God gets the glory. And this is the perception, if we're going to see persecution as a blessing. Look, starting in verse 16. He writes, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Notice his perspective. Verse 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. If you read what Paul went through, I don't know if you'd call it a, a light momentary affliction. He was beaten with rods, he was beaten with clubs, he was beaten with people's hands. He, multiple times from the Jews, received 40 lashes minus one. He was shipwrecked. He was stranded at sea. He went many a day starving in cold, in danger of robbers, in dangers from false brethren, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger from the Jews. On top of all that, he says, the anxiety of the churches daily are burdening me. All of that, a life 10 times harder than a life I'll ever live, Paul says is a light momentary affliction. How can he say that? Because when you compare it to what God has in store waiting for us in heaven, you almost can't even compare the two. Paul says, I'm willing to suffer anything if I might gain the resurrection from the dead and eternity with God, Philippians chapter 3. Verse 18, how does Paul have this perspective? Look at verse 18. As we look not to the things that are seen, he doesn't look at the bruises, he doesn't look at the the, the skin hanging to his body. He doesn't look at the wrecked ship. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So what's the perspective of the early church on suffering and on persecution? The perspective is, I'm willing to endure anything because I believe that what God has promised me is that awesome. Nothing in this world, no threats, no beatings, no suffering, can undo or wipe away what God has promised me in heaven. One more verse before we move on. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 13. The book of 1 Peter is all about suffering, persecution and otherwise. And in 1 Peter 4.13, this is the command given by the Apostle Peter, by the Holy Spirit, to these Christians who are sojourners and exiles. And in verse 13, he says, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you, may also be, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. He's saying you can rejoice when you suffer for Christ because you know 
that you're going to rejoice even more when Jesus comes back and you get to spend eternity with him in glory. What's he saying? We do this kind of equation in our heads all the time. If you've ever been on a diet, if you've ever saved money, if you've ever not done the short-term feel-good thing in order for the long-term reward, you understand the psychology behind the apostles in the early church. The long-term reward is so great, so impressive, so weighty, so glorious, so eternal, so amazing, that anything I have to give up here is worth it. That was the belief of the first Christians, and that's what Jesus our Lord teaches us. So we looked at what persecution is. We looked at the glory of persecution, how the first century church viewed persecution. Next, we're going to ask this question, how or really it's a statement, how to be persecuted. If persecution is a blessing, how can we be persecuted? Now, I'm not saying we should have a death wish. I'm not saying we should run into danger. I'm not saying you've got to book a flight right now to Iran and start preaching on the corners. But I am saying this. Just what Jesus said. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when men revile you and speak all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. How can we live that kind of life? I've got four or five things for us. The first one, if I want to be persecuted, not that I am looking forward to it, but if I want this blessing, how to be persecuted? Number one, to be persecuted, you must live the Beatitudes. You must live the Beatitudes. I believe Matthew 5, 10 through 12, those Beatitudes are last in the list for a reason. If you live the Beatitudes, you will be persecuted. If you're poor in spirit in a world that prizes self-assuredness and arrogance, you're going to be persecuted. If you're spiritually mournful in a world that seeks constant rejoicing and escapes guilt, you're going to be persecuted. If you're meek, In a world that desires power and vengeance, you're going to be persecuted. If you are hungering and thirsting for righteousness in a world that craves wickedness, you're going to be persecuted. If you're merciful in a world that loves to punish its enemies, you're going to be persecuted. If you have a pure heart in a world corrupted by sin, you're going to be persecuted. If you're a peacemaker in a world that loves and makes money, off of war and conflict, you're going to be persecuted. If you want to be persecuted, you don't have to look very much further than just Matthew 5, 1 through 9. If we're going to be persecuted, it will be by living the Beatitudes. Number two, if we're going to be persecuted, it will be because we live and defend righteousness. Notice again what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 10. Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Jesus is saying it is the follower of Jesus and his dedication to righteousness that brings the persecution. It's not just that we look funny or we smell funny or we act funny. It's that we are devoted to righteousness. And people who love sin hate people who are devoted to righteousness. And then when they see it on us, not that we're self-righteous, but that we follow Jesus humbly because we're poor in spirit, That righteousness brings mistreatment. It brings resentment. Don't let the world make you cower in silence when you know that what it's saying is not true. Don't let the world make you cower in silence when you know that one day Jesus will judge the living and the dead. Don't let the world make you cower in silence when they trample on his word and act like it's not important. Blessed are you when you suffer for righteousness' sake. Number three, how to be persecuted, we must be identified with Jesus. Notice again verse number 11, those last three words of verse number 11. On my account. We're not slandered just because of who we are. We're not mistreated just because of who we are. He says you're going to be persecuted and blessed because of your identification with me, Jesus says. Turn over to John 15 in your Bibles, if you would. John chapter 15, and notice verses 18 through 20. And notice what Jesus says to his disciples. He could say very well, 
the same thing to us today. The world is still the world. I know sometimes for us it seems like the world is getting worse and worse. The world has always been bad. Since Adam and Eve ate that fruit, the world has been bad. Look at John 15, 18 through 20. When God made it, it was good. Asterisk there, I don't want you taking that out of context. But ever since sin entered the world, the world has been the world, and the world is opposed to God. Look at John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, if I was persecuted and the world hated me and I died unjustly, and if you follow me and are my servant and my disciple, what makes you think that the world won't hate you too? And it's not that we hate the world. We're commanded not to love the world the way of the world. We want the world to be saved. But we're not of the world. And if we're not of the world, why would we expect the world to treat us as one of their own? We read in 1 John, there the apostle tells us, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Why not? Because we're not of the world. We don't, we don't do the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. That's not our lifestyle. And we're reaching out to others for them to be saved. We're not being judgmental or hypocritical. It's just, hey, we follow Jesus. And if you hate me, it's probably because you would hate Jesus too. We're told in 1 Peter 4.12, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. Lastly, how to be persecuted. We need to fear God and not man. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, we read, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. What is Peter saying? Peter's saying, imagine the blessing that comes from God, something that no man can undo. Don't be afraid of their threats. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. Don't fear him who, after he's killed the body, there's nothing else he can do. Fear him who has the authority, who, when after he's killed the body, to cast into hell. You see, our fear isn't for people. Our fear and our respect and our reverence is given to God. Think about Acts chapter 5, verse 29. They're commanding the apostles, speak no longer in the name of Jesus. What do they say? We ought to obey God rather than men. Sometimes we're never persecuted because we fear men more than we fear God. And when people tell us to stop, we listen. And when we get the vibe that they don't want to hear about it, we stop. And instead of being a herald of righteousness like Noah, we shut our mouth and we fold our hands. But the Bible tells us, don't be afraid of their threats. Don't be afraid of being ostracized. Know that you are blessed if you're persecuted. How are the persecuted blessed? Four things and the lesson will be yours. Number one, from Matthew chapter five, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake inherit the kingdom of heaven. Notice what Jesus says. That's the blessing he gives there in Matthew chapter five, verse number 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He said the same thing about the poor in spirit in verse number three. The poor in spirit are often persecuted because they're not self-assured. They're constantly repenting. They're constantly trying to get others to repent. He says the blessing is you know that the kingdom of heaven is your possession. That's the language he uses in verse number 10. Who is the kingdom of heaven for? The kingdom of heaven is for those who are so devoted to the sake of righteousness that there's nothing that this world can throw at them to get them to stop. We read in Romans 8, 16 through 17, that the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God, verse 17. Verse 16, verse 17. And if children of God co-heirs with Christ, notice this statement, Romans 8, 17, provided that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. See, the kingdom of heaven is for those who walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And if Jesus was persecuted, 
we should expect to be as well. What is the blessing of persecution? Number two, we have a great reward in heaven. Look at verse number 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Again, it's the same psychology that ran the apostles in the early church. What's waiting for me is so much greater and so much better than whatever's here that I'm willing to suffer whatever necessary in order to attain it. Jesus says, you have a great reward in heaven. You know, I would have just settled for a reward in heaven. What does Jesus say? You have a great reward in heaven. Heaven already sounds pretty great. And Jesus says it will be even better if you're persecuted for my sake in the path of righteousness. Number three, the blessing of persecution is found in the fact that we are in good company. Look at verse number 12. Again, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When you're mistreated for your faith, when you're ostracized, when you are bullied into silence, and I've been there, it can be easy to feel like you're all alone. Let's not forget about that great crowd, that great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews chapter 12 mentions. Let's not forget that when we suffer for our faith, we are in some great company. The Bible greats. All the prophets, to one degree or another, suffered, whether it was Ezekiel or Isaiah or Jeremiah or Moses or Amos or Zechariah. You could go through the list. If you're going to be devoted to the truth of God, those who hate the truth and those who love sin are going to mistreat you. In Luke chapter 6, there's a parallel to Matthew 5, 10 through 12, and there Jesus doesn't only give beatitudes, he gives woes. And in Luke chapter 6, Jesus tells his disciples, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so they did to the false prophets. Anybody can tell something what they want to hear, sell somebody what they want to hear. But a person who's devoted to Jesus and to righteousness and to truth can tell somebody what they need to hear. And those two things are very different. Lastly, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 with me once again. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14, the last blessing of being persecuted that we'll mention this morning is the presence of the Spirit of glory and of God. That sounds weird. I'm just quoting the Bible, so don't tackle me out of the pulpit. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 14, notice... But the apostle tells these Christians, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. And he's going to tell us why. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. When you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're not alone. When you're insulted for the name of Christ, God is there with you. And you can look forward to his glory. You can look forward to his presence. You can look forward to knowing that whatever you suffer here for his sake is worth it. Why are the persecuted blessed? Those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Those who are reviled for the sake of Jesus. They're blessed because they are a friend of Jesus. To be a friend of Jesus is to be hated by the world. But there's blessings to be found in being mistreated for the sake of righteousness. While we are under a divine woe, if all people speak well of us. If we want to belong to Christ, to be comforted by Christ, to possess the kingdom of heaven, we can expect to be persecuted, to be reviled, to be mocked, to be slandered, to be misunderstood, to be ostracized. It might not all be on Polycarp's level. It might not be worshiping in secret in China like some of our brethren are doing right now. But if you don't fit in, if you're excluded, if you're mocked, if you're snickered at, if you're mistreated at all because of your faith, know that you are in good company and God's spirit rests upon you. That you have something to look forward to that makes it all worth it. More than that, we have a sympathetic high priest, Jesus Christ, who's been where we've been, who has endured more than we'll ever endure, who's sitting at the right hand of the Father to give our petitions to him. We should be honest with ourselves. Maybe we've never experienced this blessing. I think all of us have to one degree or another. Maybe we've forgotten about the blessing of persecution. Maybe we have been bullied into silence. 
Maybe we have decided that it's better just to go along to get along. Maybe we've never been persecuted or reviled or mocked because we've never stood for anything. Brothers and sisters, Jesus gives us something to stand for. Many people spend their whole life looking for something to live for. Some find it in a job, some find it in a spouse, some find it in a child. Jesus doesn't just give us something worth living for, he gives us something worth dying for. He gives us something worth suffering for. He promises us, us resurrection from the dead and eternal life for all those who are in Christ and bear the reproach he bore. Brothers and sisters, are you happy today? Are you blessed? Are you fulfilled? Are you striving to be poor in spirit? Are you trying to be meek? Are you striving to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Have you been persecuted for the sake of righteousness? Maybe you, hearing the words of Jesus, are emboldened to wear your faith a little bit more on your sleeve. I hope you are. And I hope you'll remember that whatever pushback you get will be worth it because the blessed and the wonderful result of suffering for Jesus Christ is salvation through him. If you want to take part of that salvation, to be part of something worth dying for, I hope you'll be buried with Jesus Christ in baptism today. And come forward while we stand and sing.